metaverse has increasingly become a convergence of a whole new range of technologies coming together to form the next generation of the internet, which is more immersive, interactive, and intuitive. So you can see everything within the smart city environment, whether it's waste management, energy securities, and people-centered like metaverse design, etc. they are all coming together by a whole range of different technologies, which is very amazing. And of course, perhaps among the metaverse environments, the most significant application a lot of people are talking about is digital twin. Singapore is uh, really leading the world when it comes to digital twin. So in 2022, they created the world's first digital twin for a whole country. And they are using like a laser scanning of the whole country together with thousands of satellite images all into one system like uh, our excellency has talked about how the digital dubai has been utilized different like data points all fit into one system to really allow 24 7 like optimization ai in the end especially generative ai has become one of the most powerful building block for metaverse web 3 at scale to allow us to build the future cities that's sustainable The Web3 has oh the God, three main elements, like the refined, artificial yeah. intelligence, the blockchain, and, and the spatial computing or 3D computing. We at Emirates, we focus more or focus initially on the immersive experiences and the spatial computing part. So a lot of like enterprises, they prefer first to go for like a more conservative model. So trying out like slowly while like calculating the ROI, calculating the risk on the image brand, so that they will be sure like and that's what we're doing at emirates that so that will be sure like whatever we are providing to our passengers and internally as an organization is coming in the right time and in the right form through the evolution of sandbox first being a mobile game where people like contributed their time their energy to share uh, content with others that uh, we don't just live out of passion and like to grow like a sustainable creator economy where players are contributing to like the content of their favorite games we needed another form of reward and essentially blockchain and web3 is a technology solution that enables true digital ownership so anything you buy with real currency or you create or you earn as a gamer or as a creator will be yours and then can be utilized across not only just one platform, but many platforms, meaning like you and your digital identity, your avatar, your creation, your land, your house, your equipment, whatever you choose. Web3 represents a change in understanding the consumer, right? The idea is you make, you merge the consumer and the community member into something new. Effectively, in the past, we had customers who buy products, and that was sort of it. Now, Web3 represents a change where the customer effectively owns a stake in the product brand that is issuing something, in some sense. The idea of ownership underlying is not necessarily the first thing you sell to someone, but it's very powerful because like it allows you to re-engage with audience, it allows you to create incentive where people who own an asset are actively incentivized to the growth and the success of a platform, and they receive a portion of uh, the value. It doesn't need to be only financial value, it can be in many other ways, emotional attachment, perks, benefits, and so on, of being part of that community and, and contributing to the growth of a platform. What I think I've seen from the, the folks I've met across all these industries in, in the metaverse and Web3 is that the community is a significant part in changing the customer experience. It's not just about owning it and potentially making money off of it. That is a part of it. Yes, you can make money as a customer off the underlying token issued by the brand, but there is an incredible tribalistic need in the human condition to be part of something more than just yourself. And I have seen this time and time again across more, uh, we at Artstyle, we are an investor in communities. We have bought across gaming communities, communities like the Board Ape Yacht Club, Artifact, Clonex, Doodles, all of these big communities that raise billions of dollars, millions of dollars. What I've seen there is a, pa a, a, a passion which extends beyond nationalism, which I find extraordinary Extraordinarily interesting. When you ask people about like how many people have entered or enjoyed the metaverse, 
what they think of is like the social element of the metaverse. But when we're talking about the business, there are like other elements, like for example, the training element. Training element is like quite crucial, important, and metaverse is bringing like a real value or like immersive experiences in general, brings a real value. Like I'll give you an example. Like one of the duties, I'm not sure if a lot of people knows that, uh, one of the duties of the cabin crew is to deliver a baby, if that's the case, on the flight. And it's more frequent than you think. So what happens like before without having a metaverse experience? They will watch videos, they will see presentations, they will see maybe like a one case, but like how many like uh, pregnant ladies you're gonna bring to get like a real life check on that. But while having like this kind of immersive experience over the metaverse, they will be having the like a more realistic of how they can do that from one side. From the other side, let's say for example, when we talk about safety, like if we're gonna like make a simulation for like, if there is like in case of a fire inside an aircraft, like what you can see, what you, you can see the fire, you can see the like the, what kind of steps you need to take. This you can see over like a training or a presentation. But what you will not be able to know until you have this kind of experience that people will start to freak out and run, that people will start to scream, people will start to hit each other. These kind of scenarios, when you have like an enterprise metaverse or immersive extended platform, you will be able to easily add on to that and edit that and um, like make sure that those are like, those cabin crews, especially like the, what we call them, abin issues or like the new ones are like quite ready when they get into their flights that they are ready to handle such situations. We've been uh, planning to have digital twins to enhance our airport operations. So um, we have, you know, with digital twins you require real-time data. So we have pockets of areas, uh, something we have called real-time DXP, which is a real-time digital view of every, airport, every airplane that lands and takes off. Um, how they park, how they depart, and we have also all our guests, so every passenger that passes through Dubai airports, we call a guest, and we have real-time view of how all our guests, as soon as they come off from a curb all the way to gate, how they travel through the airport and where all the, um, where all the points of where queues are building up. So what, we're, we, what we will be doing when it comes to digital twins is taking all that data and creating a holistic view of all airport operations so that our control center, which is called um, AOCC, Airport Operation Control Center, can have a real-time 3D digital view um, so that can have a more contextualized view of airport operations. So the, what that will do for us will enhance airport operations, uh, give us a lot more safety and security uh, as well, and uh, basically uh, optimize of the uh, experience that we give to our passengers. Digital Twin is taking off now, although Digital Twin has been there back since the NASA 1960s. So what we're trying to do is step back to that thing. We're first trying to build our AI model is for one of the important vertical that we have, which is the uh, sustainability in terms of waste management, specific waste management, which is the only unique plan that we have in the entire Middle East today. The objective of the predictive modeling is how to see from the data that we have for the past 14 years, how do we safely predict who, what is the next, what do you call, uh, how do we predict the next waste coming into us and how fast can we go to them? And once we're able to do, do that thing, that means we'll be able to make sure we conserve our CO2 emission and methane emission. Now, alike of those, the factory that we have today in Dubai, we're building many factories globally as well. So for that to happen, that means we have to think from now on, how do we have digital twin for all these factories so we can create and make sure we benefit of the data from the local market and also make sure we use an international market and bring that data over here so we can minimize the cost and operation and proactive maintenance that need to be done on the plants. In real estate, BIM is, is the first model. When, when you get into construction phase, you, you build a right BIM model. So on top of uh, leveraging the BIM models that we've built, we're leveraging the assets uh, from the BIM model to, to build the digital twin, and particularly in terms of uh, having the right simulations for our communities to be able to, to uh, measure uh, and integrate the smart city solutions that we have uh, onto the digital twin and to manage the environments that we have from an operational perspective. We're also leveraging digital twin from an urban design perspective, so uh, integrating that with uh, virtual reality and having that to test the designs and go through the design concept that we have and, and getting feedbacks from customers in terms of you know, where the improvements are in terms of our design <laughs> concepts. 
And last but not least, we, we use digital twins for a lot of our infrastructure planning as well within the communities. Be it airports or, or buildings or, or even um, car factories, it's a very complex design process and having a digital twin for it to see the processes beforehand before even starting to construct it uh, saves a lot of you know, resources, um, costs and money and, 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 and involvement of people. So that's there, so we call it iFactory, so our latest plant, which is going to be um, operational in 2025 in Hungary, was purely designed digitally uh, before even the first you know, construction started. Uh, and, and that allows us to eliminate um, uh, processes that are wasteful, uh, it reduces the energy costs at the end because we don't need to check if things work in the real world or not. So that's there and that's a, a complete, actually all of our plants, you can have a virtual tour. Uh, there's a complete 3D scan of all of them, which not only is, is a fun thing to do, uh, like, like Google Street Views, but it's also it helps us to, again, reduce, reduce the cost. So that's on the production side. On the consumer side, actually we are launching right now, or we just launched in Dubai with our importer a car scanner. So you drive in the workshop through the scanner and the scanner gives you a, a digital twin of your car. And what it also does, it has sensors which detects minimal scratches on the paint uh, or it detaches any issues which is visible uh, uh, through the scanners or, or the profile depth of your tires and it can give you a report. Uh, and as in, you know, what to do and where to look for, for your future services, so that you basically solve them as early as possible, so the damage does get, get higher. Digital Twin, just for simplicity's sake, what, what is it exactly is all about? It's about you have something, a virtual asset or a processes, you create a virtual reality of that thing, so you can study the implication of the, virtual, uh, the physical world virtually, first of all, to make sure you're able to control the damage and understand the challenges or whatever you need to do before actually it goes to the real life of it. So what does it mean that you require a lot of data? So it actually feeds a humongous amount of data. So for you to make it actually a mainstream, you need to make sure you reduce the cost of data. I mean, we've been working with data for, I mean, I was working in an organization, we were present in 100 countries. And I was leading a regional law where we have all kind of data about clients. And we have to cut them and segment them and so forth. So cutting, putting, bring up data and processing data requires supercomputers. They're not easy to do. So these are expensive things. When you store the data as well, they're also very expensive. So that means if you reduce the data and processing data and collection and uh, uh, storing data, then it makes it easier for people to adopt it. But what about the simulation model? Because once you have the data and write an accurate data, then you need to build the model to simulate what you want to do in the virtual world. And those simulations need to be corrected all the time. Now, simulation models are very, very expensive. So AI comes to it as well, which are very expensive. Either you buy it to private, as we, as we saw in the morning when the speeches were given. So one thing you could do, you can make it an open source. Like Linux is an open source, uh, what you call system today. So if you make it an open source, that's when you have enough people or com communities of people are developing that. And that would reduce the price for people to think if they want to adopt a digital twin. The other thing is, uh data security and safety because everything is in the cloud uh, if you save it over there uh, with, the, with the cloud computing it means that we need to be sure that uh, data that we save over there for the computing models are, are safe and secure so we need um, uh, the companies really assuring that and also the regulations uh, uh, confirming that and last but not least Big data without use doesn't make any sense. Yeah? So if you have all the data, you need AI, you know, as you said, Maha, that, that needs to feed into this, that gives predictive maintenance, that gives predictive you know, ideas and, and what to do. So even the adoption on the AI side will certainly also have a, have a positive impact, impact on the adoption of, of digital twins and the analysis thereof as well. The historical data and the real-time data that's incorporated in the digital twin allows us to go play back in time and also do predictive analysis on the model, right? Uh, so it allows us to, to explore new potentials that we've never seen before, so proactively. So many different airlines, passengers, nationality systems that run, run the airport 24 by 7, you know, having, cleaning the data is one of the biggest challenges, making sure it's accurate. Um, and I think on top of it, the governance around how that data is being used to create our digital model, uh, models 
has been, you know, uh, a challenge that, you know, we're, uh, we're overcoming now. So governance is, is absolutely key. And I echo what uh, Maher said, just getting the right people, your data engineers, your data scientists that can create those models is a big challenge uh, for us. Um, so, you know, the lead time to get those resources, but it's vital, right? As long as you have the right people, that process when it comes to governance and having access and cleaning and data, you know, uh, will be, as long as you have support across the entire organization, then you'll have a successful, hopefully, digital twin program.